Hello, welcome back to Scripture Central. I'm Lynn Hilton Wilson. And I'm Jack Welch. It's nice to have you with us again. And we're excited to talk about Mosiah's chapter 18 through 24. This is a fabulous section of where wicked King Noah is attacking Alma. And we are right now with a little colony outside of Zarahemla, back in the land near the first inheritance of the land of Nephi. They're up in the mountains and we have some high drama in these chapters. We're at a place called the Waters of Mormon that people remember. There were enough people who remembered Abinadi. You remember he made public speeches once uh, at the beginning and then two years later. Two years later, yeah. And so there were a lot of people who were wondering what's happened to Abinadi and maybe some of them believed what he said. And so when Alma leaves the priests uh, of Noah yeah. and flees for his life yeah. and goes out in hiding, there are people who ask about it and want to know and come out and he teaches them. That's chapter 18, verse one, let's start. And it's organized in a beautiful little chiasmus. And it came to pass that Alma, who had fled from the servants of the King Noah, repented of his sins and iniquities and went about privately among the people and began to teach the words of Abinadi. And then you see right in the center here, where the, the chiasmus as it rolls in and out, concerning that which was to come, concerning the resurrection and the redemption of the people who had brought to pass the power of the sufferings and the death of the Christ and the resurrection and his ascension into heaven. So the center there is the redemption of the people. And then he comes out again, but they had to hide. They didn't want the king to know. And of course, this is the main thing that Abinadi had explained back in chapter 15. Alma is preaching Abinadi's message. And he's interpreting for them that passage from Isaiah chapter 53. So tightly written. And he's interpreting that passage that the priests used from Isaiah 52 as he then says, read on, and they have chapter 53. So these servants, people who had been there in the court, they'd witnessed some of this, and they are then the leaders of the group that will come out to find a bit, to find Alma at the Waters of Mormon. It says that the Waters of Mormon are um, out on the borders of the land, and that the king named it that. So King Noah knows where this little oasis or whatever it is in the um, area is, but they are able to have enough time to gather there without being found that we get a group of 204 souls. I look at it as the first branch of the Waters of Mormon or the first Waters of Mormon ward. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point that this must be a very beautiful place. It's described how beautiful, how wonderful, and that it's called the Waters of Mormon. Uh, I think Mormon leaves that little point in this record because this is where his name will come from. Ah, good, good point. That's great. It's, the literature is so tightly woven. It's just beautiful. But as these people gather, he begins talking about the qualifications for baptism. That's chapter 18, verse 8 and 9. And he says, you have to repent in order to receive your redemption. And I think Alma emphasizes redemption so much because he needed to be redeemed. He had taken his position as a priest and used it incorrectly under the leadership of wicked King Noah. And so being redeemed is not just important to Alma, but for all of us who've ever sinned in our life. He really focuses on that, on these qualifications. And I think it's really interesting that twice he mentions the word desire. Oh, yes. What do you something. desire yes. if you desire to be baptized? I, you know, what do you really want? I think that's a very uh, powerful question, an insightful, motivating question. Uh, what is wanted? What, what do we really want in this world? And if we really want it, we'll fight for it. We'll get what we really want. That's right. And sometimes, you know, what we want, if we live in want, we need something. We lack something. But it's one thing to just know that we, we lack certain things and then want to do something about it. And what we desire, what you deeply desire, what does your heart really desire? Uh, and sometimes you have to ask for that desire to be changed. It's possible that we desire the wrong thing, but when we hear the gospel, when these people heard the words of Abinadi, all of a sudden they had vistas of eternal life open to them and they desire to know more. And how can we obtain 
and claim these blessings. After desire, the second qualification in verse 8 is to be called his people. And then number 3, to bear one another's burdens. Interesting there. Uh, Alma realizes that becoming a covenant person isn't a private matter, in a sense. You don't just do this by yourself. In order to be a baptized member of God's organization, you, you must welcome other people and be willing to sacrifice, to care for them, just as you hope to be cared for by them. So even though the ordinance of baptism is an individual ordinance, it involves a acceptance into the people of God. Yeah. And part of that being accepted into the people is verse 9. You have to mourn with those that mourn, comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and stand as a witness of God at all times. So this is where we get our young women, young men's theme coming from right here in Correct. this first branch of, of Christians there in the waters of Mormon. And they serve him, and then we have to keep his commandments. This is such a contrast to wicked King Noah and such a contrast to the what was being taught before. You know, Alma is taking his text from Abinadi and from the Spirit. And we use it now. It's our, I don't know if we ever call them qualifications for baptism, but we have to have a desire. We have to repent and receive the redemption of our Savior and mourn and be willing to work together. Well, you're right. And in many ways— Texts like these in the Book of Mormon will become the administrative or priesthood handbook for the early restoration, and still today. We use these texts to help us understand how the church should be organized and the ordinances administered. It's Joseph's first experience of learning how to organize a church. came right here during the translation process. Then. That's right. And the baptism, although he doesn't take them one by one and have a baptismal interview— he does interview them as a group yes. and requires them to realize these are the things that are prerequisites. And if you want to go forward with this baptism, with this immersion, with this public display of your willingness to abide by these covenants and be God's people, whatever that might require you to suffer, if you are willing to do that, then the baptism can go forward. And they say it's the desire of our hearts. Again, repeating your desi desire word in verse 11. And, and what do we learn about the way in which baptisms should be performed from this text? Well, I love verse 14 when it says he, he was buried in the water. It, it's more than an immersion because he's talking about bearing the old man. He's talking about taking off your natural man and, and becoming a, a child of God, becoming a, a Christian, becoming a member of Christ's kingdom. And I love that idea of burying us in the water. And I, I found that that's not only used here in the Book of Mormon, but it's also used, of course, in the early Christian church. Any Anytime we wanted to come into Christ, we are dying with him as we walk down this into the water and then coming out a resurrected being. You know. Isn't that a wonderful Person. image? And of course, we do appreciate other elements of baptism, especially washing away of sins. But the thing that we need to, I think, realize more than just the washing away is the rising from the dead, from being spiritually dead in a way, and rising to a new life. And they do. This whole branch starts growing after the baptism. Initially, we just have these 204 souls that are baptized, and then they grow, and he has to ordain priests. He says one priest for every 50 people. So first we have four, but then that grows by the end of this chapter, 18 to, to nine priests. You know, we've got 450. But he, he talks about what I want you to preach in your gatherings. I want you to come together. I'm now in chapter 18, verse 19. He gave them a commandment that they should teach nothing, save it were the things which had been taught, which had been spoken by the mouth of the holy prophets. Even he commanded them that they should preach nothing, save it were repentance and faith in the Lord who had redeemed his people. Now, it was wonderful Judge Tom Griffith that pointed out to me um, of all the attributes of Christ, he's our good shepherd, he's our um, friend, he's the one he wanted to emphasize with the baptism was the redemption. 
and, and, and in the churches now that we're talking and preaching of Christ, he wants to emphasize the redemptive nature of Christ. But it's, this is just one of the commandments that he gives now. So he's giving this commandment, preach this in church. But I counted them up, Jack. I'm trying to follow your good example. I got 10 commandments that he gives, not necessarily the word commandment, but 10 different things that he says, I command you. And then he gives 10 ideas. And this is the first one, preach of Christ, teach of Christ, which just Nephi has said earlier as well. We, uh, of course, have to put this into the situation that Alma is in. These are brand new converts. As far as we know, they haven't had much instruction. Well, not from Wicked King Noah, at least. (laughs) I don't think we we say that this is the only thing that you can ever preach in sacrament meeting. There are other topics that need to be displayed and explained. As long as they're tied to faith and as long as they're tied to our Savior, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the words of the prophets and the, yeah. So we begin with kind of the, the first axiom. And this is the thing that we always want to be sure we're preaching. Uh, We aren't in sacrament meeting or in general conference uh, to to talk about things that are economic or political or worldly, always tying them into what do these have to do with the teachings of Jesus Christ, increasing the testimony of Jesus Christ, and looking forward to when he will return. So, Lynn, what are the other commandments on uh, uh, Alma's list here? No contention. I was thrilled to see that there. He says, we have commanded them that there should be no contention, and then they have to look forward in unity. This is number three. Look forward with an eye, having one faith and one baptism. And number four, their hearts are knit together in love. And then we have to skip down a little ways. Um, Verse 23 then talks about the Sabbath day. Now, off the top of my head, the Sabbath day is one of Moses's 10 commandments. But these other ones to me have been part of a higher law. These are higher commandments that he's giving. Number six, give thanks every day that you should give thanks to God. That's verse 23. And then skipping down to verse 24. The priests have got to labor. (laughs) This is very important to him. We don't want to get too much in your head. Then in verse 27, he says, Alma commanded that the people of the church should impart of their substance. Then in 29, having been commanded of God, they did walk uprightly. So they've got to be obedient, I see, as, as the ninth one. And then number 10, they impart to one another, both temporally and spiritually. These are a higher law. Jack, I see this as the law of consecration. I see this as, as Alma First Ward living a Zion society. I think that's right. But let's not ignore the fact that one of the things that Abinadi quoted to the priests of Noah were the Ten Commandments. Right. Yes. And so what Abinadi is recognizing is that Even the priests of Noah who knew the Ten Commandments hadn't gotten to the deeper meanings behind these texts. There are links, as you've pointed out, to some of these. And if you scratch the surface a little bit, you can find that the links into some of the Ten Commandments are are there. Oh, good. Tell us more. Yeah, great. We'll take the last one uh, that uh, you must uh, give both temporally and spiritually. So temporal things, you give. Now, the last of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not covet. And the one before that is thou shalt not steal. So it's not just enough to say you shouldn't want and shouldn't take, but you should give. So it's it's related to, but it's kind of a reversal of the negative, making it now a positive. Which then again is the higher law. Another way that Abinadi here is building on something in the Ten Commandments is we do have the honor the Sabbath day as one of the Ten Commandments. Yes, yes. But then what he says is you must give thanks, and not just on the Sabbath day or on the holy days, but any time. I think that it was normal to give thanks on the Sabbath day. That's a big part of ancient Sabbath worship. Thanks and praise. And I think Abinadi is saying, let's recognize that. And do it daily now. Let's do it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Working back up the list of these Ten Commandments, 
uh, remember that there is uh, one about no contention. Yeah. And uh, leading to unity. Remember one of the first things that uh, Jesus will say in 3 Nephi chapter 11 when he pe- appears and will call his 12 disciples there. He emphasized there shall be no disputations among you. Which is contention. Contentions. Yeah. And here Alma is calling these priests and he's giving them and the whole people but these uh, instructions to uh, that the priest shall labor and not be paid. And so... It's a uh, higher law. It's, it's, but it's building on things that uh, we've already seen in the Ten Commandments. And finally, I think that the first of Alma's uh, instructions, that we should teach nothing but the Word of God, is very similar to the first commandment. You shall have no other God before me. So it's not just enough to say, I don't worship any other God, but I must affirmatively now worship God. teach yeah. and make teaching a big part of worship. And it's not just teach, it's faith in the Lord. It's going from the word to the heart. But unfortunately, this beautiful Zion society is still being hunted and chased. And so chapter 18 ends um, down in verse 34, saying that the armies of King Noah have found them and are going to come and get them. And so they flee. They take their tents, whatever they're living in. Um, I don't know if their flocks came with them. I hope everything came with them. And they go to find a new place. Turning to chapter 19... Uh, here's where we uh, are taken back. We're taken back into the city of Nephi. And there we have Gideon with his military duties. And uh, the military is about to uh, kill King Noah. I think it's pretty consistent that Gideon was one of the judges in the Old Testament who was a military man. And now here we have a military man with the same name. And why were they wanting to uh, kill King Noah, kill their own king at this point? Gideon was not one of the priests of Noah, so he is obviously a military commander, probably knows Noah, maybe had been some kind of a guard for Noah, but he knows of all of the wickedness that Noah has been engaged in himself yeah, and perpetrating yeah, yeah, upon the yeah. people. Yeah, and, he's, and, he's, and he sees his wickedness as so bad that he should be killed. So chapter 19 describes that Gideon in his anger says, I'm going to kill the king. And as he climbs upon his tower, the king realizes I'm going to, I, my life's over. And he looks out and there's the Lamanites coming upon them. And so he says, spare my life. I, I want to, I'm so worried about my people. Well, he's not worried about his people at all. Within two or three verses, he tells his leaders, his military leaders, abandon the women and children and flee with me out to the wilderness. And some follow and some do not. Gideon is one of those that does not follow him, obviously. But the Lamanites come in and a lot of people are destroyed because this is the beginning of another battle between the Lamanites and the Nephites. So the Lamanites may have been coming worried that they aren't getting paid enough. And it seems to me that as they're looking at the tribute or the tax that's coming to them and then comparing it with the opulence of King Noah, yeah, yeah. I think they're probably right that Noah is not paying a full tax. <laughs> or else he has plenty on his own. <laughs> or he's interpreting it somehow his, in his favor. Yeah, so they want some of his opulence. So they come to make an enforcement of, of this agreement. And did you notice who the mediators are? Who stops the war? So wicked King Noah, the priest, many of the men have run and fled. And it is the mediation of the women. In the Book of Mormon, women are shown in a very good light here. It is the women and children that go before the Lamanites and try to come to some sense of peace and stop this war. And it is um, recorded in chapter 19, verse 13. And it came to pass that those who tarried with their wives and their children caused that their fair daughters should stand before and plead with the Lamanites that they would not slay them. And the Lamanites had compassion and they were able to come to a peace treaty. Um, you know, you could read this perhaps misogynistically. They're using um, women because of their beauty, but I don't read it that way. I say they were able to somehow um, communicate and come to a peace agreement. They're the mediators that are chosen and they do a good job. As we look at chapter 19, verse 20, it says that the people of 
King Noah were angry with the king, and they caused that he should suffer even unto death by fire. So this is fulfilling Abinadi. This is fulfilling right. the prophecy that was given. However you kill me, you're, it's going to happen to you. But they, the men of Gideon come, and they talk to the people that had killed the king. And then it says in verse 24, um, they had ended this ceremony that they returned to the land of Nephi rejoicing. So there must have been some unity because these were separate parties. Gideon was trying to get rid of the king men. So they have some sort of a ceremony? Yeah, that's a question we don't have a real good answer to. Uh, but the word ceremony and cremation sound a little bit alike. And there may be a manuscript issue here. Who knows? I think more likely... In the ancient world, no one took regicide lightly. If you're going to kill your king, there has to be some kind of ritual or some kind of, you know, a kind of ceremony where the king's life is then taken. I don't know what it would have looked like here for these people, but I think it's not just, well, let's have a bonfire and get rid of him. They probably take his... Uh, royal implements, probably take his robe off, take his crown off or whatever he has. I don't know what he's carried with him out into the wilderness, but probably enough that they first dethrone him yeah. Yeah. And, and then they, they kill him. And this ceremony is between the people of Gideon and these people who had fled. That's right. And so whatever they had done before, they probably tied him up and then put him on uh, a bonfire, a pyre, where where they did it. And Limhi then is a descendant of Noah who's back in the land, and he then is made king. It says, Limhi, being the son of the king, having the kingdom conferred upon him by the people, made an oath to the king of the Lamanites and his people that they would pay this tribute one half of all they possessed. And then they have peace for two years under this new contract. But in chapter 20... We now go back to figure out what happened to the rest of the people who fled out in the wilderness. What happened to the wicked priests of Noah? And that's chapter 20. And we get the daughters of the Lamanites. And um, at some time of year, it's probably good weather. They're out dancing and it sounds like there's no men around. The women are just having a wonderful time. And um, the wicked priests of Noah are too embarrassed to go home. So it says that they are laying wait and watching. And when there's just a few of the women there, they go and kidnap 24 of them. Yeah, so this must be a place... Uh, that was used for some kind of festival Bathing or something, or yeah. Some, something on a regular occasion that yeah. they knew there was an appointment. There's a time when they'll be there. Maybe they even had been there once. So a war breaks out over these daughters, and it says that the people of Limhi are fighting for a higher cause, and they have the Lord with them, and they're defending their families. But I also have to add that the Lamanites are also fighting for their daughters, but they don't know the ways of the Lord. And they actually are defeated in, in a sense. In fact, even the king of the Lamanites or the king of this area is defeated and, and they leave him and um, the soldiers of Limhi and Gideon find him and bring him back to King Limhi. And he says, what were you doing? You, I've been paying you 50%. What's the problem? And that's when we get this beautiful understanding that it was probably the wicked priests of Noah, and they're able to pacify the warriors, um, both the king and the soldiers of Limhi and Gideon's men uh, are able to lay down their arms do, go, and go forth to the army of the Lamanites without their weapons, and they're able to make another peace treaty. So they have peace again for a few years. The first battle, the people of Limhi are attacked by the Lamanites, but they're so upset about paying this tax that three more times they go after the Lamanites. They initiate a battle. This is chapter 21. And of course, all that's happened is they're, they're fought. They're, they have more and more deaths and there's more and more widows. And it's, I appreciate verse 17, King Limhi, um, you know, he's doing the wrong thing by going to war, especially as an offensive warfare, but at least he's taking care of the widows. And he says in verse 17, he commanded that every man should impart to the support of the widows and the children that they may not perish in hunger. And they're finally becoming so humbled and so needy of the Lord 
that they send out some people to go up to Zarahemla and find help. We need to get out of here. We, we need your help. And they don't find them. And look at verse 17 there again. It says that there were a great number of women and there were more than the men. So maintaining the policies and the uh, practices of King, King Noah, there were several battles and many people were killed. Men were killed. And in a fairly small population, that means there are going to be a lot of widows. Uh, and now this may also play into, you know, the question of, of why many wives were taken by the priests, because there are a lot of these women, and who's going to take care of them? So it's a complicated situation, and their needs are great. But they don't find Zarahemla when they go to ask for help. No. They go up. What do they find? Clear up to the land of desolation. So it's further north. As you look at it very closely, it says they pe- they go up to a land where there's been, this is verse 26, a land that's covered with dry bones. Yea, a people which had been peopled and destroyed, having supposed it to be the land of Zarahemla. So they think that the people of Zarahemla have been destroyed. They go back to the land of Nephi, but they bring with them a record. This is verse 27. A record with them, even a record of the people whose bones they had found, and it was engraven upon plates of ore. Now, we've heard about these plates of ore earlier. This is all really complicated, isn't it, Lynn? It's kind of hard to realize. We need kind of a roadmap to figure this out because it's true that we, we say, yeah, we've heard about these 24 gold plates. It was back when Ammon comes and he speaks with Limhi and he tells, gee, we tried to find you and we couldn't, but we came back with these plates and they want to know back in chapter seven and eight, do you know anybody who might be able to translate these? And now we're learning now how, we're where they got Now we're picking up with that story yeah. and we figure out, oh, now we know a little more about how they, uh, they found those plates. And 24 gold plates, 24 priests, I think that's circumstantial, <laughs> but it's... Uh, Easy way to memorize it. Maybe a curiosity, and that's why the fact was there. We don't have to be told how many plates there were, but in any event, this kind of duplication uh, is kind of a, a trigger. You say, well, what else is doubled in the book of Mosiah? And might this have something to do with the overall composition of the book? You mean that earlier we talked about the 24 plates and now we're talking about them now. Is there any consistency? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Structurally. Jack, are you suggesting Mosiah, all of Mosiah is a chiasm? Well, that was my first thought. Yeah. Having found it at the word level and knowing from this that chiasms can be not only at the word level but at the book level. Yeah. I started putting together a little list of, well, what happens in, in the, the book, book of, of Mosiah? And I think knowing this helps readers, it helps me, to follow what's going on in the book of Mosiah Great. and why they've included certain stories and not told a lot of things that they might otherwise have said. So, for example, and where I began was with the beginning, where Benjamin, Benjamin, Benjamin is going to install Mosiah as his successor. Well, at the very end in chapter 29, Mosiah will install Alma the Younger as his successor. Yeah, perfect, perfect little castle. And in a way, the whole book of Mosiah is held together by, uh, by King Mosiah. He's there from the beginning to the end. So it's all about the time that Mosiah is Rain. the king. Mm-hmm. Benjamin announces that Mosiah will be his successor. Mosiah then receives the records. And that's important that the king be entrusted with the sacred relics and the brass plates and other records. Well, what happens just before Alma is made the successor of Mosiah? Alma is given the records. So this transfer of records, not that important to us, but to them, these are the insignia of authority. Of authority. Oh, no, it's very important. Uh, In Benjamin's speech in chapter 3, we have Benjamin giving the words of the angel of the Lord. There are only two places in all of the book of Mosiah, I think, where the angel appears. And one is there to Benjamin. And then, of course, <clears throat> Alma the Younger. Alma the Younger in chapter 27. Sons of Mosiah. Where they hear the words of the angel at the point of conversion of Alma the Younger. People enter into a covenant at the end of King Benjamin's speech. And 
the, the important point in chapter 26 is that unbelievers refuse to enter into the covenant, Just and we'll talk opposite. about that next week. Yeah. It's important, though, that the people who are in the church that Alma has organized are covenant people. Yes. And so becoming covenant people under King Benjamin, following his speech and writing their names in the records, uh -huh. is then echoed by the importance of the covenant in Alma's church. Yes. Then, of course, we have Ammon going in chapters 7 and 8 from Zarahemla to Lehi-Nephi, and he finds Limhi. And that's where we are right now, because Ammon uh, eventually will return from Lehi-Nephi with Limhi's people. And the echo, or counterpart of that, is Alma eventually returning. Yep, of course. Now, when Ammon talks to Limhi, back in chapter 8, they then tell about the 24 gold plates. And but they don't go are. in very much detail, but now they take the time to have uh, a reprieve where we remind you the 24 gold plates are mentioned, and now we learn more about how they were discovered it, and why. This is just amazing, Jack. This is absolutely perfectly yeah. organized. Wow. Chapter 11 is about Noah and his wicked priests. Uh-huh. And chapters 18 and 19 are about Noah and his wicked priests, which Again. we've just been talking about. <laughs> yes, yes. So the center then is? Well, the center is Abinadi being imprisoned in chapter 11 and 12, echoed by Abinadi actually being killed in chapter 17. But the center is Abinadi's sermon then. Yeah, look at that. Abinadi reads the Ten Commandments and Isaiah 53, and then Abinadi gives his explanation of those texts. And I would like to add that the center then is Christ. Abinadi is pointing to Christ there. The Absolutely. coming of the Messiah, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New World is our Savior. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Wow, yeah, that nice? Jack, well done. Well, so uh, I actually did kind of figure that out. It's pretty obvious once you know yeah, what to look for. To look for. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I published that back in BYU Studies in 1969. Oh, ho, ho. so it's been around for a while. I'm sorry I missed that one. I was, uh, I was born, though. So, so you I... can look this up <laughs> on BYU Studies, and here's the page with, all, uh, with a few more details. Uh, but uh, that was an exciting moment. And that also, by knowing the chiastic structure, it allows us to see where we're going to finish up today's lessons. Because now we look at chapter 22, we've got 23 and 24, and we learn about the plans to escape. And the first people they talk about is how Limhi's people are going to escape. And of course, that's when we mentioned Am Ammon, the Mulekite, comes to help them. And um, they go through this process of wanting to be converted, but no one can baptize them. But they've humbled themselves now to receive the Lord's help. Yes, in chapter 22, we do have them planning to make this escape. And this is the famous instance where they say to the Lamanites, we're not only going to give you a fifth of all of our wine, we're going to give you everything that we've got. <laughs> all the wine jars, everything. And of course, the, uh, the guards have a party with that. And they <laughs> yeah. take advantage of the time and, yeah. Yeah. and they are able to leave and uh, escape in the night. And Gideon, the, uh, the head of that expedition, uh -huh. uh, they will... Uh, go then to the land of Zarahemla, but they won't go to the city of Zarahemla. They will start a new little city, which they will call the city of Gideon. Yeah, yeah. They may have gone there initially to say, hello, welcome back, sure. but then they're given this extra land just as the Israelites were. Yeah, and I think it's given to them as a land of their inheritance, yeah. uh, just as when the converts of Ammon are brought up and the Ammonites are given a land for their inheritance in the land of Jershon. So... I think there's something comparable going on there. And they did it in the Old Testament, too. Um. And Alma the Younger, after he gives his speech, which we'll talk about in a couple more lessons in Alma chapter 5 in Zarahemla, that's Alma's first speech after he uh, relieves himself of the obligations of being the chief judge. And now he's just the high priest. He then speaks in Zarahemla chapter 5. But where does he go next in chapter 7 to the city of Gideon? 
And his father would have known Gideon. His father would have known... Very, very much so. So Alma can speak to them very personally. And we'll see that in Alma chapter 7. So there are lots of reasons why we're getting these stories, but it gives context to uh, what's yeah. being said. Yeah, yeah. And Great context. stay alert for that. So we now see how Limhi and his group, led by the soldier Gideon, are able to leave. Uh, we now pick up what Alma's doing with his group and his covenant people out and of the waters of Mormon and beyond. Yep, chapter 23 and 24. So at the beginning of chapter 23, to kind of get all of this clear, the Lord warns Alma, and they leave where they were first, mm -hmm. the where they had the waters of Mormon, mm -hmm. where they had become covenant people, and then they flee and get away, and they now start in another place. It's a beautiful land, a place of pure water. And there they pitch their tent, and they want Alma to become a king. I think we have to pause and think for a minute. Why would they want Alma to be a king? Well, they don't know any other real form of government. And so Alma takes a very drastic step here yes, and says, we are not going to have a kingship. We can see what happens when you have a king that isn't uh, a good one. This is in chapter 23, verse 6. Okay, great, great. And Alma says, behold, verse 7, it is not expedient that we should have a king. This is important because when Alma and his group get to Zarahemla, they will all sit down together and they will read each other's records. Oh. And King Mosiah, king of Zarahemla, will read this. Will hear this and will know that a prophet, Alma, says, you know, kingship has its limitations. So this may be the seed that will lead to Interesting. Mosiah abdicating his, his throne. Is Alma's kingship. examples. Okay. Yeah. Now, but what does Alma do to create a people that are not kings? They're not ruled. So what does Alma do? He has to have somebody who will rule. And what he does is he creates priests. And teachers. He's already done the priest before, but in verse 14, he wants the teachers to be men of God. That's right. He wants them to have no contention in verse 15. They have to love their neighbor. He goes back, he's quoting again some of the commandments. Now, let me point out something here. You just mentioned in verse 15, among the things that he says, every man should love his neighbor as himself. He's quoting Leviticus, the center of the law. Explain that, the okay, center of the law. Why yeah. is, where do we find, I thought Jesus was the no, one who no, taught. No, no, no. In fact, that's why Christ says it. They ask Jesus, what's the most important law? So he goes to the very center of Leviticus. We have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. The center of Leviticus is thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And where does, where does thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart? Where does that come from? It's the Shema, isn't it? They it's recite in, it over and over again. In the again. book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter six. Yeah. So Christ is taking the best of the Old Testament and saying, this is what it's all about. And I think that is... Uh, Quoted right here in right Mosiah 23, 15. The foundational rules that Alma wants his people to live by. I keep going back to the fact that they are living a higher law. They are living the law that Christ taught in the Sermon on the Mount right here. And he is the high priest, but he has priests and teachers. Now, priests, of course, had to maintain their holiness in order to administer in the sacrifices, and they probably are still offering some sacrifices according to the law of Moses. But now he's going to add teachers. Uh, where does he get this model that there should be teachers as well as priests? I think if you go back to what Lehi does when he ordains Jacob and Joseph. As teachers. Mm -hmm. he, Jacob is ordained a priest. And Joseph is teacher. Mm -hmm. So the precedent for having priests and teachers goes back to, to Lehi. Lehi. And finally, I think there's something important here that he says that anyone who will be one who will minister to you in any of these offices he must be a man of God, walking in his ways and keeping his commandments. Now, I think that's really important that if we're going to teach, you know, and you and I are teaching on this, this program, but anybody who's teaching. I teach in primary. Well, we have obligations. We can't just live one life one way and teach people, we can't live two lives. And we can't be trustworthy 
if we are not walking in his ways, not just talking about it, but doing it, living the gospel, and keeping his commandments, not just doing what we think would be nice, but what God wants. So I think that Alma has set up here uh, the, the spiritual, you might call it the spiritual G DNA of what the church organization should look like. And I think, again, I wonder, as Joseph Smith translated this, definitely, if he isn't already thinking, this is giving me not just ideas, but scriptural validation on how a church should run. Exactly. Yeah. In this beautiful new city of Helam, they are able to establish peace for a short time until, unfortunately, they come in bondage. And just like was prophesied by Abinadi, the first time Abinadi came, he said, if you don't shape up, you're going to be in bondage. And the second time he came and he said, you're going to be in bondage. So even though they're living a very, very, very Zion-like society, they still have to fulfill the prophecy that was given because they didn't repent in time. But the Lord does make their bondage much lighter. And it says that they could hardly feel the burdens on their back. And I'm, I really appreciate this. And the people that come for the bondage are the wicked priests under the direction of Amulon. That's verse 35 of chapter 23 that talks about Amulon's horrific treatment of them. And they don't even allow them to pray. Uh, they're furious about any religious activities. And um, it's. I just keep thinking, what tension this must have been. Alma knew him. They sat together on the bench. They worked together. They drank together. And now Amulon is just saying, you think you're so holy. And he's smacking him around and treating him terribly. Well, and these priests will become... The Amulonites, we will hear about them later in the oh, book of Alma. Oh, they come all the way through, yes. And this, their jealousy, their vindictiveness will not go away. It is so, so tender to remember the relationship between these peoples. Yeah, and Alma will actually leave without even saying goodbye. Oh, of course not. He leaves by the hand of the Lord. <laughs> and so the, the order of Nahors and the Amulonites, yeah. they still think Keep they going. may have some claim over these people. But I love what you said about making the burdens light. Let's talk about yeah. that for a little while. Because do you remember the talk that Elder Bednar gave? This was in uh, April conference in 2014. We loved using this in our religion classes when we were teaching on our mission. And the students responded so effectively to this. Where, so wherever they came from, uh, their backgrounds, we could ask them, have you ever had burdens lifted from your backs? And tell us the stories that you have, have experienced. And reading these scriptures, uh, notice that, as Elder Bednar explains, when you ask for the burdens to be taken away, yeah. the Lord doesn't remove them. Those burdens are there for you to learn something. Yeah. But what he does is he makes it possible for the burdens to be borne that they can be light, but they're not taken away. The Lord says, be of good comfort, which I have to point out is always mentioned when they're in hard times. It's a commandment of God. We have to be of good comfort because we can rest our burdens on Christ. And then in verse 14, he says, I will also ease the burdens which are put on your shoulders, and even you cannot feel them upon your backs. But they'll be there. But they'll be there. And then it says, I, God, do visit my people in their afflictions. And they were able to bear them up. And it says they cheerfully submitted to the Lord in verse 15. So there is something powerful about applying these verses in our life in any situation in, that we're in. And what is the power that eases these burdens that we bear? I think it's the atonement of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And the atoning power Elder Bednar calls the enabling power. Yeah. Yes. It's, it enables us to be able to do what we need to do. And maybe we're aware that those burdens are still there, but we're not overwhelmed, overwhelmed by them. We're not distracted by them. 
We, we don't notice them, but we're still carrying them. But what is removed is that guilt or the feeling that we, we aren't doing what we need to do or should do. But the enabling power of the atonement makes it possible for us to bear these burdens and not just to carry them out, but to do so with joy and with purpose. Elder Bednar talked about in that talk, you may remember it, the pickup truck that they went out that was was stuck in a snowstorm. And how did it get out of the, the snowstorm? Well, it was loaded. It was loaded with all this wood and other things. And, and the weight of it allowed them to, to have, get the traction. And so some, some, we have to have the Lord's difficulties in order to get us on our knees. You know, sometimes bondage can be used as a benefit. Yeah, and then, and then finally, one other thing that, that I, I really like about the idea of this yoke, that, I mean, we have this... And take upon you my yoke. Yep. And some people wonder, uh, well, where's that yoke that's going to take away the burdens? Well, when you're yoked with the Lord, it's like you're in a harness. You're, you're like pulling two you're oxen. Both pulling the same direction, though. And and that yoke, it doesn't say it's it's going to be easy. But it says in Greek that the yoke is well formed so that it fits you. And it may fit you perfectly individually. But then you can put a lot of pressure against that yoke and get a lot more done. When and of see. course, having the Savior as your partner, yeah. Yeah. that's where that image of take upon you, my yoke, uh, I think. They're applying it here. It's applied. The principle is the same. He doesn't use that. And not only um, does the Lord allow them to endure their burdens, but then he provides a way for them to leave. They don't have to get the guards drunk like you explained. <laughs> happened to Limbi's people. The Lord puts them in a deep sleep. They're able to travel. They've got their women, their children. It doesn't mention flocks, but I presume a lot of provisions because they travel 12 days in verse 25 back to Zarahemla. Now, they did one other thing before they leave. Because you, you said that they were forbidden to pray. Do they not pray about this before they leave? I think in verse um, 21 and 22, they give their thanks in their hearts. Yes. And they are able to praise the Lord and thank the Lord um, in their hearts, even though they're not out loud. Yeah. And that was one of the Ten Commandments, wasn't it? To of, of, thank God and praise. Okay. Daily. That's one of Alma's rules. And so they have to keep that rule. But he says, you know, it's okay if you, we can't assemble to do it, we can't do it out loud, yeah. but you can have this prayer inwardly. And I would like to end with my testimony that as our burdens in life become difficult, as our burdens are hard to bear, when we strive to receive the Savior's help, they can be made light and we can submit cheerfully to the will of the Lord too. Lynn, we've talked about how things happen twice in the book of Mosiah. So we get two testimonies at the end of this one. Let me bear my testimony too. Because there's so many details here that enrich this story, that make it real, that make it organized. And we sympathize with people who read through the book of Mosiah and try to follow all the comings and goings. It is so complicated. And how is it possible that this record could come forth so accurately, without a single misstep. You know, even in talking about this, we misspeak sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And yet, can't remember. has it translated with a quill? Which one of these taxes was it? Or, or is this the land of Helam or the land of Helaman? Or, you know, all of these things that are so hard for, for ordinary readers. And we, we appreciate how, you know, when you teach your primary children, uh, of course, we stick to the basics. And we teach nothing but Christ. Still, the scriptures are the portal that help us to come unto Christ. And so many things I testify in these examples of following the prophet Abinadi, of following the guidance of the Lord, in keeping our covenants, in doing these basic steps, God will bless us. I testify that this record is not just profound and deep, but exalting and elevating in every way. And I know that God will bless us 
with strength beyond our own, as the hymn sings, as we are good, faithful members of his fold. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.